All right, everybody, we're going to get this thing underway. Um, this mic is just for Twitch, so. Hey, everybody, we're, uh, we're, we're starting this thing. Again, this mic is just for Twitch, so it's going to seem real weird that I'm talking into a mic with no audio. Um, but again, we're new venue, new setup. Uh, we're, we're figuring it all out, and I'm pretty rootin' tootin' proud of like, what we got going here. And that's, I'm a dad, so I say things like that. Um, okay. So, and again, I'm, I'm masked. That's, I've mentioned this a little bit earlier, but about two weeks ago, I started getting a cough. I'm totally good, but I just, if I do cough, I want to make sure no one has that double think of like, oh, should he be wearing a mask? I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna do it. So, um, so that's, uh, that's it. Let's get going. So, um, I'm Aaron Krauss. We have Stephen Vincent back there. Uh, you might have seen, you've definitely seen him on camera with OKC Web does before. I know you can't see him on Twitch, but he's back there. Um, we both run OKC Web Devs. We've been doing that for about two, two years now is when we combined uh, JavaScript, Ruby, and Python together. And man, we've, it's, it's been a ride so far. You know, we've all done virtual and that's, that's worked out really well for our community and it's very exciting to get to come back in person and do these. This, we're not gonna, the plan right now is not to do these every meetup. Um, we're still go virtual for most of them, but uh, I think it's fun to do these in person, especially as we can safely do that. So that's me. That's uh, Stephen. Uh, I'm also going to introduce my co-talk, my co-speaker today here, Gabe Cook. Yeah, you're definitely in camera zone I don't know too. Where the camera yeah, is. We're, we're we're good. Um, so Gabe and I will give this talk, and we'll we'll get into that in a second. We gave this talk at Inatech 2021 in OKC last year. That was I think November. But it wasn't streamed or it wasn't recorded, or, and it wasn't recorded, so if you didn't get to see it there, you missed it. So that, um, while that was a little disappointing for us, it's also a really good reason to give the talk again and modified a little bit for Techlahoma because Inatech is a more, it's a business tech oriented conference, whereas we're Techlahoma, I'd say tech first here. So we revamped the talk to be a little bit more tech oriented. However, there's still a lot of business in this and that's where the all skill levels aspect of it comes in. We're gonna talk about a lot of cool DevOps tools today like Kubernetes, Docker, uh, CICD, and some a, a new, newer thing called GitOps. Um, and you don't have to be an expert on any of that to know what we're talking about today again because the business side will help paint a picture of how it all works and why it all works the way it does. But we're gonna show a live demo at the end about a, a zero downtime deployment with a personal project of mine. Uh, so I, that's, that'll be a fun, a fun thing. Um, before we get to the talk though, we are a Techlahoma sponsored organization and we have a new sponsor, which is the venue we're at right now, which is clever. So let's, uh, let's, we, we wanna share a few words about all of that. So Techlahoma, I think a lot of people here are aware of what Techlahoma is. Uh, nonprofit across all of Oklahoma, not just OKC, not just Tulsa, but all of Oklahoma. Uh, they support the user groups like ours. They, they run multiple conferences throughout the year, predominantly Thunder Plains, 200 OK, and then there's the, the UI UX conference as well. Um, and beyond that, just a great organization to get involved with. You can donate. There's many ways to participate. You can give talks here. Um, really anyone who's in power uh, or anyone who is involved in the community can help point you in the right direction to do that. There's also a code of conduct. So if, if at any point uh, you feel unsafe, whether physically or um, virtually, it doesn't matter how, just please contact someone in leadership, which is probably anyone who you see chatting quite a bit more than others, and we'll, we'll make it, we'll make sure it's all good. Um, second sponsor is Clever. So Cl Gabe and I both work at Clever, and you'll notice this talk has Clever's logo in it. Again, that's just from the Inatech talk we gave. We left the logoing in there. Um, Clever is the venue we're at right now. We're an Oklahoma City-based company, but we have uh, quite a few remote workers as well. We have quite a few people up in Tulsa as well. We are a predominantly software consulting company. We work with a lot of different clients to build a lot of different technologies. We have a pretty standard stack these days, but we work with whatever clients need to. With that said, we also have a lot of products in the works as well. Some of them launching relatively soon. Some of them a little bit. Some of them a little bit of ways off. But it's been a pretty big shift for us, and it's we're we're really looking forward to launching and, and publishing all of that. Um, okay, enough enough of that. Let's uh let's get into this talk. So Gabe and I will be. Um, you can you can stand in like the camera zone too. You don't need to be off to the side. There we go. We're we're doing we're, do we're, we're doing this together. Um, <laughs> So we're going to be talking about uh, zero downtime deployments with modern DevOps tools, and we'll, we'll hand the mic back and forth. I'm a software engineer. 
at Clever, I do a lot of development. I don't do that much with DevOps. I rely on people like Gabe to set all that up. So I want to let you talk about your stuff for a sec. This is weird. We should have gotten a speaker. <laughs> um, hi there. I'm Gabe. I'm one of the DevOps here. Uh, deal with all the stuff that Aaron just said he didn't usually deal with. A lot of uh, stuff that we're going to talk about here. So actually, I won't even get into it much. Um, but yeah, that's really me. I really enjoy like home automation as a hobby and stuff like that. It's really fun being nerdy, I guess. Here you go. <laughs> All right, let's do it. So we're going to, a lot of this talk we mentioned was originally uh, tailored for a business-oriented audience. We're going to go relatively fast through that. There's going to be quite a few slides, though, but it helps describe how it works. So eventually we're going to get to that demo that we're talking about, and that's where I think the magic will really sink in. And I'm not going to say it's necessarily like the simplest thing, but you'll get to see the power of how, once you have it set up, how simple a process of deployment can be. So let's get into zero downtime deployments with modern DevOps tools. Also, uh, if you're on Twitch, we, we're not actively monitoring the chat right now. Um, Steven is monitoring the chat. So that's basically, if you ask a question, there's a very real chance we won't get to it till the very end. So just keep that in mind. Uh, let's hop to it. All right, so I'm Aaron Krauss, Gabe Koch. We did, we did our fancy schmancy intros. We talked about Clever and how cool we are there. So let's talk about the agenda for this talk. We're gonna talk about what zero downtime actually means, because it's, it's a bigger concept than what you probably think it is. We're gonna find what down means. We're gonna actually outline a problem of why zero, down, zero downtime deployments actually is a good thing and, and what problems it solves. We'll talk about our goals and the tools and how we use them. Uh, we'll do the demo. We'll talk about how Clever does that. I mentioned I, I changed the title of that. Just how it works is what I changed it to later. So we'll talk about how it works. We'll talk about a bonus goodies section, like extra things you get by using the tools we're talking about. And then a conclusion at the end. So let's talk about what zero downtime actually means. So the actual definition, if you look it up, is it means your application is always available to your customers with full confidence in that availability. It sounds pretty simple, right? I mean, that's that sounds like an appropriate definition. But there's a bigger definition that I think you care about, and it's a cultural movement behind how your organization delivers software. And we're gonna get into this, but imagine if you're working at a company and you are, um, there's, there's a bug, an internal bug comes in, it gets sent to the tech department, you work on that, uh, it gets, let's just say, okay, it gets deployed like you know in the next release cycle in a week or two or a month, whenever that is. Well, imagine if you can flip that and say, hey, this tech, this bug came in and we're gonna deploy it in an hour because nothing bad is going to happen if something breaks because it just won't deploy if, it, if something breaks. But if it does deploy, then we've solved the problem. Like imagine being able to tell your sales team that or your project management team or like your floor workers or anyone, your clients that. It's just a whole different ballgame about how you actually think about software delivery. So while zero downtime deployments means the definition like you don't go down when you deploy, it really changes how you do everything in your company. So. Let's, uh, let's actually, oh, let's talk about what you will prefer. So I'm gonna give the mic over to Gabe here to talk about how some of this actually, actually works. Um, so when dealing with, you know, kind of a shift like this, uh, you'll prefer smaller, more frequent deployments, um, more build automation and deployment automation, uh, reproducible builds, kind of predictable, you know, set of steps so that you know exactly what's gonna happen when you're building and more frequent, smaller check-ins versus, you know, like semi-weekly, you know, big check-ins. All right, this is my, this is my fancy, this, this, this is my fun business tagline. Um, so if you ever need to, I think everybody, no matter what your role is, needs to always sell what you're doing, like market what you're doing, because at the end of the day, like you have to support your business no matter what role you're doing. So my tagline for zero down to employment is like a five line pitch of like all wins. So you're gonna save money with zero down to employment, you'll save time, because you don't, not only for the zero down time, but like how fast you work, You'll have happier customers, happier employees, and you can grow your business. Um, and I, I stand by this 100%. Hopefully by the end, you can really start to see how this all comes together. I think we have this slide one more time in here. Again, this is like the pitch. Um, all right, so let's define what down actually means. Being down doesn't mean that like everything is broken and on fire all the time. You might not even know when you're down because it might not be something that's super apparent. Uh, let's kind of go through a couple examples here. So let's say that your site's up, but a payment portion of your site is malfunctioning, even if it's still working, but let's say that like Visa cards aren't going through, um, that's down. Like you, your site is up, 
it's working in some sense, but it's not working in all of the sense. So that means it's down. So with a tool, with a concept like zero downtime deployments, you can catch that. Again, you have, there's, there's an onus on you to have an architecture that supports that, but you can catch when that happens and then not deploy it and then get alerted. It's kind of like it gives you the keys to be able to, to have that. It, it lets you be told when that is hap when that's happening, regard like as opposed to your clients telling you, which is never a good situation. So another example uh, here is when you deploy a site anytime when you start and finish your deployment without zero downtime deployments, your site is down. So if you can imagine the more old school way of coming in on a weekend, which we're going to give an example of this soon, come in on a weekend, taking everything down, putting it in maintenance mode, coming back up, that's down, even if not everything is always down all the time. Uh, so let's go through a problem here. We're going to do a little case study here. It's kind of that situation I was just uh, outlining. So you work for a big company. Uh, you have release cycles. Again, it can be weekly, bi-weekly, monthly, maybe, maybe every two months, depending on how big the actual release is. But you don't have zero downtime deployments. You have to deploy things manually on a server. And typically, when you do that, uh, it's a stressful time. Things are, um, you just, you know, you, you don't have confidence that the site is going to necessarily work right afterwards. You hope it does, and you're going to work to make sure it does, but there's a period of downtime there. So. Uh, some of the problems, you're deploying large batches of updates, which, again, you don't need to do that with zero downtime deployments. But if you're doing big releases, you know, you don't want to take the site down every day because you're deploying new things. So you, you batch them up in these releases. And to deploy those, you're working off hours. And I know that Gabe, for example, has worked in previous uh, jobs that he's had to deal with these types of things before. Right, Gabe? Yeah. All right. Take the, mic. Take the mic. Do it at the end. Um, yeah, so I've <laughs> done this before where it's like, a, you know, we'll have a cab process and we can only deploy like once a week at a specific time. Um, and for a lot of changes, that's fine. But like Aaron said earlier, if there's some urgent bug that makes it really hard to get that bug on production and, or get the bug fix on production and be able to say, yep, we're good. So having, you know, all the testing and health checks ahead of time helps a lot with being able to deploy rapidly as needed. All right. And then we'll go through a few more. So as you do this process, your application goes down. We talked about that. Uh, you don't have a, you have a lack of confidence during that downtime. It might take an hour. It might take three hours. It might take 10 minutes. You really don't know. And that's, that's a problem because even on weekends, you're probably making money somehow. Um, and even afterwards. Yeah, too, exactly. Awesome. Uh, you have to manually test. Again, with zero downtime deployments, you would have a more automated approach. But without that, you very likely have manual processes. You have to do on-the-spot decision making. Like, let's say you're deploying and your scripts, your update scripts fail mid-script and your site is like in real down mode right now because the migrations failed. What do you do? Do you spend time during this down mode to roll back or do you fix your migration scripts because they were almost done? Uh, and that's the worst possible time to make those decisions because your <laughs> things are down. So. Um, that's not a fun period. And you also have to, you know, whenever you're done with this, the company it, it depends on knowing how the, re how the release went. So you have to then have, you know, whether it's meetings, emails, formal reports, you have to talk about that. And all this stuff takes a ton of time. And again, I'm going to hand it back to Gabe because I know you've been, you've had to do this stuff before as well. It's true. And sorry, I should talk louder. Um, so on six, yeah, definitely been there. If a database migration fails, do I you know, panic, ping the dev on Slack and go, okay, what do I do? Do I spend the time, like Aaron said, rolling it back? Do I, you know, like need to involve management? There's a lot of questions where it's like, I'm just trying to deploy code and <laughs> have it all work. So I need, you know, need to know what to do. Uh, and then on seven, it's the same thing. It would, you know, typically it's like you send out an email afterwards, but if you have all this automation hooked up, then it's really nice to have it automated. I guess, just have, you know, automatic <laughs> notifications and Slack, you know, like channels that you can get pinged about the releases. Yeah. So let's take all these problems and actually put a cost associated with it. And we're going to go pretty quick through this. But if you need something to pitch to your higher ups about why this is something you should invest in, this is the section that you want to do that with. So let's, let's say that situation where you have weekend deployments, uh, it's a five person team, it can be developers, project managers, QA, it doesn't matter, managers, people are working. And uh, it takes three hours um, over the weekend to deploy. And you know, let's average $75 per person per hour. That's like the cost of a person as an employee. So that's benefits, your wages, PTO, all, all everything that makes up an employee. So that's really not an astronomical amount uh, at all. So, um, you know, for one deployment, you're talking like, you know, $1,125 there for a single release. That's, 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 a, that's money. 
But where, where it really starts to hit you is when you talk about the cycle. So whenever you de- whether you deploy every two weeks, every week, every month, again, that's up to your company. But that adds up to like, you know, in this example, almost $30,000 a year as a best case scenario. And uh, that's, not, that's not all of it. If we keep going with this, let's talk about not only the cost of being down for like having to pay your people to do that. Let's talk about the loss of revenue. So again, even during an off hours, if you're a middle, you know, mid sized company, you're probably still making a thousand dollars an hour per revenue. Again, that's, and that's not an absurd amount by any means. Um, so during this time, if it took like, you know, let's say three hours to deploy, um, let's say that you were down for two hours or something. Um, oh, and to kind of caveat this number, Amazon supposedly makes over $800,000 a minute. So we're, we're talking quite a low loss of revenue there, but it still adds up. So if you were down two hours, <coughs> again, just all that fun. Um, if you were down two hours, then um, that's 2000 bucks of lost revenue. But again, you do this every two weeks and that's over $50,000 a year. So now you start adding those together and a best case scenario for like a yearly non-zero downtime deployment process is about 80 Gs. And worst case scenario, you know, let's just double that. So to, again, kind of, uh, so yeah, over, over $160,000 a year for your worst case scenario. And then, um, we're not even considering a bunch of other things like employee mental health. Like no one wants to come in on a weekend. No one wants to do that. You're going to lose, you're going to lose employees to do that. It's, it's bad marketing when you have to go down at all. Your customers are going to feel that. And, um, you know, kind of the ending business tagline here is do you, if you're budgeting for the next decade, do you really want to spend like over a million dollars on just deploying your product when you don't have to do that? And that's, we're going to start talking about how you can actually do that. So let's get to our goals here. So our business goals with zero downtime deployment, you've already seen these. We're going to save money. We're going to save time, have happier customers, have happier employees, grow your business. I promise we're getting to the tech side, everyone. Um, we just want to make sure we paint the picture first. So let's talk about the how. How does zero downtime deployments actually work? And there's really two concepts here. And I'm about to hand the mic over to Gabe in a second to talk about the actual concepts here. And then we'll get to our demo. You have build automation and blue-green deployments. And I'm just going to hand this over to you. Sure. So yeah, you you have build automation and blue-green deployments, and I think we have slides that go into each one here. Uh, Maybe not. Well, I don't remember. Uh, So uh, I I thought so. So yeah, if you, you know, again, are automating your builds, and we'll mention some tools that we use um, here in a bit, then you can, you know, uh, detect those failures early on ideally, instead of when you're trying to deploy code, you know, when it actually comes time to push it. And then the blue-green deployments are great because that's, you know, the actual runtime. All right, we started up the new code and something's not right. Like, let's not swap users over to it. Let's stay where we are for now. Um, And yeah, I think there are slides that go into it here in a bit. Does this one go back to you? I think this one goes back to you. I think you're right. (coughs) Okay. So, um, these, uh, the build automation, blue green deployments that allow us to avoid those costs that you saw, you're going to have to have some setup costs, like build the thing, but that's like a setup one time only, and then minor maintenance going forward. Um, it's not a regular cycle and it's a much better process. You're going to be able to automate the deployment process. Um, you'll never have to take the application down for any reason. You know, it's, it's never going to go down. And then one big win too, is that we can scale up as big as we need to. We'll get into that in the bonus section, but if you, if traffic is a concept that you deal with at all, that's a struggle, this process will help make that better. Nice side effects. Yeah. So the tools and how to use them. Okay. So with build automation, um, you want to automate uh, like in CI CD, but also just your whole development process. Um, if, developers can use that same build on their local machines versus what we use during, you know, CI and CD. It helps a lot with, you know, making sure that there's not weird bugs that happen in one specific environment and keeping everything much more predictable. Um, And I probably should update this because there's not just Docker anymore. Uh, But, you know, containers are great with using anything really. Docker, there's now container D, build kit, Build and Podman, there's lots, uh, but container images are great because, you know, your local like development machine can look pretty much the same as what's running on Dev and even what's running on Prod. Um, and then we have CI to actually build, do linting and testing and things like that. 
um, testing, and then CD to actually you know, poke Kubernetes and say, hey, there's a new version of the code, start deploying it uh, for all environments. <coughs> so then the blue-green deployments is, as I kind of mentioned earlier, it's a process where you don't actually, you, you start running the code on your server, but you don't actually deploy it until it looks healthy. And this isn't like before um, blue-green and after blue-green, this is Whenever we spin up a new container, we have this before, and then once it looks healthy, we have after. So for some reason, I made the users a little monitor. So the users are up top, and they're not actually directly hitting the app. They go through a load balancer. So in this case, on the left, we've spun up the new instance of the code in the green container, and we wait usually you know, a few minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes, depends on the app. Uh, but once it starts passing, Database migrations are done. Um, you know, any sort of like file changes that need to happen or anything like that are done. Health checks pass. We swap users over to green, and then after a little while, we can delete the blue completely. And we use Kubernetes for that. That's you know pretty common nowadays. It uses deployment orchestration, so we can just say like, here's what I want to run, and it figures that out. You define you know, the container you want, the health checks, all that stuff, and it, you know, it, it'll spin up the new one, and whenever your health checks start you know, becoming a green check mark, it'll swap it over. Uh, you configure a healthy state, and then <laughs> that's that side effect of, if we have all this, we can scale up a lot of times. In a lot of cases, if we need to, we can set up some auto-scaling and things like that. Is there anything else I want to mention? No, let's go ahead. And we'll kind of bounce back and forth between the demo and the talk. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> so we are going to be making a zero downtime deployment to the Cyrus Lyrics API. So that's a personal project of mine. Um, Cyrus Lyrics is an iOS app that is actually in the App Store. It helps you to be able to like find the lyrics or store the lyrics, I should say. <coughs> um, of the songs that you like to sing. Uh, I like to sing to my son, and his name is Cyrus. So that's kind of where the inspiration there came from. Um, but the API is a Go API. It facilitates OAuth communication with uh, with Google because the data is actually stored in Google Sheets. I just I wanted a way to update it uh, as easy as possible. And if you were to download the app, then your data gets stored in your own Google Sheets too. So we are going to make a zero downtime deployment to this, and I want to show some of the the setup for this here. So. <coughs> okay, um, again, just that annoying cough that just won't go away after like weeks. Um, so we have a, um, my project up here, Cyrus Lyrics API, public repo, you can check that out. I have got some commits up here, and the actual site is deployed right here at api.cyruskraus.com. Again, I know it's Cyrus Kraus, that's, that's like my actual son's name. Project's called Cyrus Lyrics. Yeah, I get it. It's a little bit of a deviation, but um, I just I already had CyrusKraus.com, so so we went with that. So um, this is if you hit the root page, there's nothing to do with the root page. There's all all the API stuff is on endpoints, but it does give you an indication of like, hey, if you're here, don't be here. Go to this site here. We are going to deploy an update to that. That and I have the commit already here, but it's not deployed. So if I click on this commit, you can see the update right here. We are changing that route to say, um, hello, OKC Web Devs, to see our talk slides, go here. So, and that's the URL of our actual slides right now. So what we'll do here is we're actually going to, we'll talk about how it's all set up, but let's go ahead and start the process of deploying this with zero downtime. So if I go back to this, what we're gonna do is, <coughs> uh, however you deploy your sites, it's kind of up to you, you can do it on push, you can do it on a tag. What we're going to do is we're going to add an actual git tag right here. So to do that, we're going to go to our, um, let's see, go to our releases right here. Let's go, let's go to our tags here. Let's go to view all tags. And you can see we've got v1.0.5, 1.0.4, 1.0, uh, et, et cetera. We're going to create a new release for 1.0.6. And what that's going to do, that's going to trigger the continuous integration to build a new Docker image that I have on Docker Hub, we'll, we'll show all of this. Then that will, um, we're gonna use a concept called Git Ops, which we'll probably talk about a little bit later, that will pull down that image once it gets updated, it'll detect the version change, and then the, uh, 
um, the GitOps piece, that, that part of it lives in my Kubernetes cluster, and we won't, we won't be able to see that because I'm not authenticated on this computer, but we'll be able to see that, um, that the site gets redeployed, and we'll talk through how all that works. So let's go ahead and just create a release, and that's all we have to do. So again, I've already committed the code, so we'll just do that, so we'll draft a new release here. We will add a new tag. 1.0.6, we'll create that new tag, and we'll just say the same thing here. My typing with a microphone is uh, a little bit challenging. Make sure I labeled that correctly, looks good. And uh, we're just gonna, just for demo purposes, we're not gonna put a description here, we'll publish that release. And uh, good to go. So now if we go to this GitHub action, this is where you see ICD, um, however you have it, um, this is what will trigger it. So. I have a job set up on this repo. If we click on it, we can dig into it. And it does a few different things. It'll do the lint, it'll do the test, and it will, um, then if both of those pass, then it will actually build and push that up to Docker Hub. So let me grab a sip of water. Okay. And this will take about two minutes total, so for everything, um, so the, the lint and the test should start completing here soon, hopefully successfully, if I've done my testing properly. Uh, so they did. And again, this is a Go project, so it's running in Go, Go lint, Go test. And the build is actually running. This will take about a minute or so. Let's actually look at what the code is doing to trigger this right now. So this is using GitHub Actions. If we go to the code, GitHub Action workflows are stored in .github slash workflows. There's some other versions. You can have other paths for these files too, but this is my one CI file right here. And this is all just YAML um, and you know GitHub Actions, it's, it's written for GitHub Actions. So we have our lint job here, that's it. We have my test job here, that's it. I'm not gonna go over specific syntax just because it's, you'd have to look at the tool specifically to know exactly how to use them, but um, relatively simple. And then the build process here once the lint and the test pass, then we will push it up to Docker. It's gonna detect certain versions that are pushed up. Um, it, it gets my username and my token, and then it pushes it up and builds it and everything. So by now, this has surely finished. So let's go there. And yes, the check mark there. So that's successfully built. So if I were to go to my Docker Hub, I now have version 1.0.6 pushed up. So that doesn't deploy though, that's just the continuous integration part. The deployment part is the second part of that that uses a concept called GitOps. So we're gonna get into that. I kid you not, I learned about this over the weekend and like built it on this. So I'm pretty new to this myself and it's kind of a new concept anyway. Um, I wanna say the term GitOps came about in like 2017. Um, so. While that is still years ago, it's still a relatively fresh concept. Um, so the way GitOps works is, uh, and I'll let Gabe talk a little bit more about that, but I have a separate repo that has configuration files that my Kubernetes cluster will pull down from. And again, if, you're new, if you've never used Kubernetes or anything, don't worry about the specifics, just kind of get the concepts here. So my Kubernetes cluster syncs with this. Um, this is how the GitOps work. And, um, It'll grab the YAML files here, and it'll basically say, okay, whenever I detect a new version update, which, you know, of this pattern right here, 1.x.x, so we, we pushed up 1.0.6, then do a redeployment. And you'll notice uh, we have a commit here from one minute ago for version 1.0.6. That's how this all works. So I have, as part of the GitOps pipeline, it will, um, I've got it set up to scan for certain images that's using that policy I was just showing you about. And when it detects that update, it will put a, it will commit into this repo. Again, I didn't commit that. You saw Flux CD bot. Flux is the tool that's actually doing this. And then um, it will trigger this deployment right here. <coughs> Again, I'm, man, this this talking while having like this old cough is like just super annoying. Um, okay, so this line right here is pretty important. This is how it, this is what it committed basically. It committed this particular line right here, and I told it to do that based on this tag right here. And we're getting into specific tech here. The tool here is called Flux that's doing this. I don't want to weigh in too heavily on that. Again, just the concepts are the big thing, but yeah, I'll let, I'll let Gabe do that. Um, but um, that went ahead and redeployed everything. So um, if I were to refresh right here, it, you know, automatic deployment right here. And, um, you know, I didn't, I wasn't doing like a constant, 
refresh to like prove that it was zero downtime, but the way Kubernetes works is those blue-green deployments that Gabe was talking about. So my old deployment was up, and then by the time this one was healthy, it'll just shift traffic over. So we can see the deployment here. All I did was um, all I did was push up a tag. And if you've used GitHub pages before, that's actually that uses CI CD. It's not going to be this exact same way. GitHub, of course, does it its own way. But whenever you push up code, you view the deployment. Um, that's, the, that's, that's a zero downtime deployment right there. So there's a good chance you're already doing this, even if you didn't necessarily set it all up. Um, so that's a demo of how we kind of have it right now. Um, we didn't show any Kubernetes config, although I do have that um, public right now. But that doesn't really that didn't really tie into the actual deployment. The Kubernetes is more just the, the, the config there is just how it actually works in normal time. But I do have that as a public repo um, that I'd be more than happy to share as well. So that's a demo of, again, all we had to do in this case was just push up a tag. Everything else kind of cycled there. It is a reasonable amount of config to set up, but it's also not the end of the world. Like I, we walked through the CI YAML that does all this. We walked through a little bit of the process here. This is actually not part of this is the deployment, but this is, I, I had already set this up for my own cluster. I just copy and pasted that. The real part that is the new stuff here is there's a couple other config files here that basically detect, that basically say, okay, what Git repo should we be detecting, or what, what Git repo should we be committing to? What image on Docker should we be, you know, scanning? It's, it's, but they're, you know, again, the config files are not too heavy here. Um, so a little bit of setup time, quite a bit of, oh, am I, that's interesting. That's that's fun. I'm probably I must have. Uh, okay, let's try to go back to my uh, my profile there. Yeah, you you go. Ahead. Ops rundown. So um, Git Ops. I wanted to say this earlier in the talk, but the demo was going. So um, Git Ops is a super cool shift. Um, we mentioned, you know, Kubernetes and blue green and containers and everything like that. Uh, Clever's now been using Kubernetes for hosting for probably two years or so, three years maybe. Um, and we're working on moving everything over to GitOps. So it's basically closer integrating those Kubernetes clusters that you have running with a Git repo. And it's really nice. Um, you know, as I mentioned, you make a deployment in Kubernetes and it automatically will deal with the blue greening and making containers and stuff like that. Um, but you still have to manually say, hey, there's a new version out there. So it's nice to be able to deploy a tool that can watch your repo and actually help automate that whole pipeline without needing to manually say, hey, Kubernetes, go go look for a new version. Um, so with GitOps, you usually have an agent running on a cluster. And some common ones you'll see are probably Argo CD and Flux are the most common. There's pros and cons to both. So we went with Flux in this demo, and that's kind of you know what we're looking at here at Clever, too. Uh, Argo gives you a nice little UI, which is kind of fun and cute to use, but Flux is a lot better with Helm charts, so it, you know, there are trade-offs. Uh, but yeah, in this case, it, it picked up the image change in his, uh, the actual app repo, the Cyrus Lyrics API, and it automatically did that commit. So it's, just, it's really cool to have a lot of that automated for you, and that's really, that, that's the imp yeah. well, well, no, you, you, you got more talking to do. Do I? We gotta go through, uh, What's next? We got to go through how it, everything we just demoed. We got to talk about how it works. Oh, well, I just did that. <laughs> so. Cool. so, yeah, he, he had those changes already up on GitHub. Um, they were in the master branch. With Go, typically you want to try to use semantic versioning. So we were using Simver for this. Uh, so when it was in master, there was a Docker tag, but it just doesn't get deployed yet. And which Simver, if you're not familiar, is the... Mm -hmm. X dot X dot X, like one dot O dot O, two yeah. dot O dot one. They all have meanings. Yeah. Yeah. They have meanings to denotate like a breaking change or a small API change or just a little bug fix. So whenever he tagged it, that triggered the CI that we watched, uh, the linting and the testing and the building. Um, that was that GitHub action script he showed. So this slide is actually a little bit out of date. Instead of CD notifying Kubernetes now, they just have an agent that watches for changes, and it picks that up. Yeah. That's kind of where GitOps really changes the game, and I think that's what the next slide yeah. is. So. There we go. There we go. <laughs> I got ahead of myself. That's all. Uh, we will, we'll, we're thinking about giving a talk at, at either the DevOps user group or in the future about GitOps, because we... We're brushing over it very heavily here. Again, I just I just did it for the first time over the weekend. Um, but very yeah. powerful new paradigm about how continuous deployment um, 
or continuous delivery, whatever you think the D stands for. I've seen both sides. Um, how, how it works. You should have been mic'd. My bad. Uh, um, I don't think you know. So, you know, just, just like earlier in that chart, there's the new deployment. We keep routing traffic to the old one, wait for it to become healthy. It still doesn't get traffic, but then once it's healthy, we start, you know, routing users over to it. And then we get rid of the old one. That, that's the same picture. It's just kind of a call back to that same picture. Um, and then there's some bonus stuff. Mm -hmm. So you also get a little bit more than just zero downtime deployments uh, with Kubernetes as a whole. You kind of, uh, you get a workflow that can scale up and down automatically. You can set up scaling for each container. So I can scale up, you know, my app with a certain number of servers, or um, you can scale up even the servers that are running, you know, each client worker. So you can scale at multiple levels if needed. And you know, you can set limits. So some apps like production could scale up more than development could and things like that. It's pretty nice for you know, cost saving while still being scalable. Uh, you get a workflow that's self-healing. If you have health checks defined, then your application goes, you know, something goes south, it'll try to restart it. And you know, if that keeps happening, we have notifications set up so that we can go in and look. But you know, if your application itself goes unhealthy, Hopefully it'll, that'll get fixed. And then if you know, a Kubernetes server goes unhealthy, usually uh, we use cloud infrastructure for this. And typically you know, there are health checks and it'll recreate that server, which we have seen happen before. Uh, you kind of get an architecture that's a little bit more secure by default. If you were to just set up a server um, you know, in the past, like a VPS, a DigitalOcean server, a Linode server, something like that, um, you know, that's fine, but when you install the database, for example, you could accidentally expose the database publicly. And with Kubernetes, you have to explicitly say, hey, I want this to be public. So it just kind of out of the box, you know, things are much more private. It also, you know, holds secrets in a separate place from your application and you can encrypt secrets and things like that. Uh, so it's, it's, yeah, closed first is the approach. Do you want to give the conclusion? Yeah. All right, so I hope we've made the case about how zero downtime deployments are not just like what it says it is, and it's more like an organizational shift. Because again, everything we just did here, imagine like your development team, they just push up, they merge pull requests, it gets deployed. I know a lot of us have things set up that way, but not all of us do, and there's always ways to improve that too. Um, but if your organization is not on a zero downtime deployment setup, it can really radically shift how you deliver your product, not just like the software. Uh, even if you're like manufacturing like a physical product, like that's gonna that's gonna way get improved from a, an automated process like this. Um, so you can download the slides. It's a uh, clvr.sh. That's short for clever. Uh, .sh. That's our URL shortener. Slash OKC Web Devs, and that'll get you the slides you have right here. And then um, I'll share on the Meetup page the the repos we were working with right now. Actually, one of them is private. The 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 one where you saw the the Fluxbot commit. That's a private repo, and that's partially for security, just so that it's not super clear what version of everything is deployed on my cluster. Um, and also just because it's gonna be committing quite often, and that's, that'd be annoying if like you went to my GitHub page and it showed I have a bunch of commits on like a certain thing. Um, that it would just, yeah. So that one won't be public, but um, I'd be more than happy to like share some links about how that is actually set up, uh, and some links about Flux. Um, so, we mentioned we'll talk about GitHub, GitOps a little bit more in the future because that's definitely a newer concept of CD. Um, I think that's... Uh, so, quick thing I want to mention. We actually got a question at Inotech that I, I, I want to kind of reiterate here. Uh, it's still kind of a work in progress even here at Clever. So, somebody asked at Inotech, how, how do you do this with databases? Uh, like this is hard with a database. If you have a breaking database migration or something like that, what do you do? Um, and you know, like I said, we're still kind of working on that. There are some solutions I've looked into uh, where it can basically clone your schema, run the migration, and if it passes when it promotes the pod or container, it will run that same migration against the, the live schema. And th those are pretty cool, but you need to make sure you have a system that can you know, migrate forwards. And well, I guess, 
I was going to say also migrate backwards, but I guess if it's doing against a secondary schema, it doesn't need to do that. Uh, but basically, there are some tools out there that we might actually mention in the slides later on if you guys want to go to the URL uh, that will do that sort of thing. Clone your schema, run the migration, make sure everything looks good. And if so, when it gets promoted, run it against actual production. And that I just thought I'd mention that because I think that's a pretty good question that we're still looking into ourselves. It turns out storing data in you know, a distributed way is hard. Yeah. There you go. And that's also probably a good use case for using the cloud tools that you might be familiar with, like GCP, AWS. Um, there's tons of other ones out there, but yeah, on the data side, for sure. So uh, we'd like to open it up to some questions, both here and on Twitch. So Stephen, we'll, we'll depend on you if anyone's asked anything on Twitch. Uh, in the meantime, does anyone have any questions about how this stuff works? Yes, Dustin. That's a good point, yeah. Okay, so the question was, um, can we talk a little bit about some of the other side effects of the benefits of CICD? So, um, and this is at Clever, for example, we've, I'm gonna let Gabe talk about this, but we've built some pretty, we, I say we, um, Gabe and our DevOps team, have built some really cool features that make lives for us as developers much easier because of it, but also for our clients too. Uh, so, Gabe? Yeah, so um, this is pretty common with Heroku, but we implemented it ourselves in the cluster that we run you know, a lot of our current like, development sites on. Um, me and one of our other DevOps engineers, Mitchell, set up temporary environments. So with Kubernetes, we have some automation with our Helm chart set up where when a dev has a change on some branch, they can just add a tag in GitHub and say, I think it's temp deploy or something like that. And then it'll automatically set up a new site, generate a you know URL with like a color and an animal dot some dev domain and give you an actual dev site. Right now it, it just mi does database migrations from scratch, but we, you know, we're investigating maybe replicating our, the actual dev site data over or running database seeds or something. Uh, but that was kind of a nice benefit that didn't actually take as long as we expected because, you know, we already had deployment automation, build automation, wildcard certificate. So it was like, actually we can put this together now. And it, you know, it's, it's pretty nice whenever the, the, the PR gets merged in, then it destroys that environment, everything goes away, and you're back to where you were. So that's nice. Uh, it fixes a lot of Git issues we've had in the past where like, we have a big change going on on dev, and then they're, you know, the client urgently needs a bug fixed. That can be really annoying you know, if you are just working on a dev branch. So it, it's been nice. I think that's the main benefit we've had. Um, I'll take the mic again if anything else comes to mind. Well, and also on that, uh, as soon as our DevOps team built that architecture, we had a client who was like willing, ready to use it. Um, we had about six different features that they wanted at the time, and they were all being actively developed on separate branches, but we didn't know how we were going to deploy them like separately, probably just have deployed them on a dev branch, like Gabe said. But this allowed us to say, hey, here's six URLs like to go test these individually out. And it's just a win like for client relationship management um, because... They get to pick and choose uh, what's, what, gets to, what needs to be deployed and when. Um, they can test things out in their own environments that are, that are isolated. Uh, it's just, it's, it's, it's a great thing all around. Um, yeah, question on Twitch? Very good question. So how long did it take me to get the GitOps portion set up? And that's gonna be, Specifically, what you see in this repo right here. So the tool is called Flux. Uh, Gabe told me about it last week, um, like Thursday or Friday. And I think I, s so I started it on Saturday and uh, worked a little bit then, worked a little bit on Sunday. And then yesterday, in preparation for this talk, Gabe helped me out a little bit. So it is, so I'll just go ahead and specify uh, the time specifically to, to get me to set up this for the very first time. Um, was a handful of hours, like probably five or six hours and that's quite a bit of time to do something i get that but it's like a it's it's challenging to think about how this stuff works now hopefully this talk has outlined a little bit about how this works it's still going to be hard if you're not of a devops oriented mind doing this which i am not so like gabe could do this radically faster than i could um, but i did it as a learning experience 
um, you know, ran into problems, but it, it, then you fix them. That's just how it works. So the six hours might be a little bit of an overshoot, but I don't want to, I don't want to downplay that. It does take a little bit of time. That said, I've got the setup for Cyrus Lyrics API to add this onto another project. We're talking like 30 minutes, um, just cause it's like, it's going to be copy paste right now. Like I'll, uh, these two YAML files are just, they're not related to any project. It's just pull in the images, like, like scan images. Like it, it's just a job basically. These are the only three that are actually related to this project. Um, so I would literally, if we're talking less than 30 minutes too, like copy them, swap out the things that are specific to this project. Um, and, and that's it. So. Um, another thing that comes to mind is uh, with GitOps, uh, as I mentioned, you have an agent running in your cluster. So the initial setup definitely, you know, like Aaron said, takes a lot longer than setting up in specific apps later on. It's usually a cluster level agent. So, you know, if you have multiple personal projects running in a single Kubernetes cluster, you can set up Flux, for example. And then after that initial setup, it, you know, just takes some configuration for each app. Now, there are some other considerations to make. Uh, it, conveniently, in this case, Cyrus Lyrics is pretty new, and also it's built in Go, which is kind of, you know, built for this sort of thing. Uh, you know, Go really prefers Simver, and it you it's really closely integrated with Git anyways. Uh, Implementing it at Clever, some of our you know older code bases and things, it's been a little bit harder because a lot of these you know we have a dev branch that's kind of a rolling release. We don't have Simver; it's it's a little bit harder to version you know a full website like that. So you know th there are some considerations you have to make, like how how do I get it to deploy some tag to dev on an ongoing basis, but not prod? If you have this agent just watching, you know how how do I filter that? So. Flux lets you do like a regular expression if necessary. Uh, obviously here, yeah, Aaron did. Deploy 1.x.x. So 1.1 1 .1 or 1.0.5 would get deployed automatically. But again, if you, you know, if you don't have Simver, it can be a little bit harder just to get that initial setup going. I think it would have taken quite a bit longer then. So. Yeah, I saw Bobby had a question back there. That's a very good question. I'd, yeah, I'd say if you feel comfortable, like, uh, let's say, would anybody like to mention that they are doing CI/CD currently for their company? All right, so pretty, pretty fair amount, solid. And then the the other side of that, we'll say not currently doing it, and we'll give the caveat of, but would like to start doing that. Good deal, good deal. Great question. What about GitOps? Has anyone here really touched GitOps much yet? Nice. Just curious. We also appreciate everyone raising hands. I know that's not the the easiest thing. Yeah. In the room, because we have a small conversation in Twitch that has a few questions, and we'll kind of build on top of each other, but I don't want to take away the spotlight. There's someone here that wants a question. Yeah. I have a question. Oh, so you said that like when you're delivering the one that you you don't have any traffic going to the one that's that's coming up. Have you had any? Okay, so the question was um, that I, I had mentioned whenever you spin up your green deployment, you don't have traffic going to it. So how do you, you know, how, have I dealt with like shadow deployments or simulating some sort of traffic to it to determine if there's going to be errors or not? And uh, that's also still kind of a work in progress. Right now, we mainly rely on the actual health checks and rely on, you know, making sure the health check pings the database, pings, you know, if we have a memory cache, like make sure it hits Redis. Um, there are ways to simulate traffic and, you know, make sure that no errors are triggered or slowly start moving users over like at, on a percentage of requests basis. Um, but no, so far it's more been health check oriented uh, for me at least. And I was going to say, here's kind of an example of some of that. Your liveliness probe to make sure you're up and everything. Um, there's many ways you can implement health checks, but just a thought there. All right. Yeah. Some Twitch questions. Right. I kind of started a conversation because you showed your, your and it was, I know I'm not going to beat you up on your very simple diagram for the switching of deployments that we just mentioned, but 
it wasn't great. Yeah, that's a good point. So the question is, like, how do I roll back, um, basically? And I forgot to go into that earlier. So um, in our case, we t a lot of our sites use Laravel, which has database up functions to add, you know, do the new migration, and then down functions to go backwards, and a lot of, you know, uh, Rails esque. Uh, frameworks have this kind of thing. I've seen it, you know, in a, in a lot of different languages. So in our case, we will do the migration and we just have to make sure to not, you know, like delete columns or anything like that. We try to make the migrations, aim them towards kind of a rolling, you know, basis, add new things or move tables if needed, but don't like delete a column because that could cause an error in the live site. Um, and then the, there's a timeout. So currently we use Helm and you can tell Helm, you know, like timeout after five minutes. And so if it deploys and the new pod never goes healthy, then after five minutes, it, it's like, okay, we're going back. This isn't, you know, something's not right. And then it'll notify us and we can look manually into it. Um, yeah, that's really what, what I've done so far. And what else? Ooh, so it's, um, the question was, do you like save the, you know, the old version or do you just kind of deploy live again? Uh, so Kubernetes actually will keep the old and new version running for a little bit. It'll spin up the new pod and once it swaps over, it'll start terminating the old one. But since we're using containers, these all originate from a specific image. So instead of, you know, going, okay, something's wrong. I have to rebuild the old version, we still have the image. So if we need to, it can, it can just swap right back. Uh, but whenever it's doing the blue green, the old one stays running and the new one stays running. And then when it's finished, it goes, okay, time to delete. Um, but, but yeah, since it's on an image basis, if necessary, it could be swapped back to the old image instead of having to like rebuild and possibly break something new. Anything else in chat? Oh, yeah. Have you guys tried any CSV pipelines that don't involve Kubernetes? Maybe serverless or something else? Um, a, a little bit. Um, about that question. Yeah. No, no, I mean, repeat the question. Oh. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking on it. So the question was, have we dealt with um, CI CD pipelines and things uh, that aren't in Kubernetes? And Yes, we've used like lambdas and cloud functions a bit. Uh, they actually usually handle a lot of this stuff for you. Whenever you you know say, here's my code, do it, it will make sure that the health check passes first. Uh, I really like cloud run also. It's a, you know, it's a great system that just incorporates health checks and percentages of traffic. But cloud run actually uses Kubernetes behind the scenes. It just kind of abstracts it away. Um, but yeah, I've used those. Um, and it's nice that it just handles a lot of this. Uh, Heroku would be another example, but I haven't used Heroku much myself, so I can't really speak to it. Which Kubernetes are using? Oh, uh, the question is which Kubernetes cluster we're using. We at Clever have a few different GKE clusters, so Google Cloud. Uh, we've used AWS has EKS, uh, which is very nice too. Uh, GKE is a little bit more powerful with auto updates and things like that. I think just because Google makes Kubernetes, but uh, EKS is pretty nice. Uh, and then personally, I've actually played with a uh, hosted Kubernetes instance in Linode, and it is about the same, honestly. I haven't had an upgrade happen yet, so I don't know what that looks like, but it's basically like, all right, we'll deal with the master, and then we give you servers. So. I would definitely suggest any of the cloud ones if you know budget permits over doing it yourself. The Kubernetes setup is pretty <laughs> pretty involved and you learn a lot, but it's nice to be able to just click a button and get it all built out for you. So Yeah, I'll kinda tag on oh, to yeah, that too. Yeah. yeah, so I've 
personally, I've always been a fan of like just the DigitalOcean five dollar droplet. I like if anyone's like getting started with like knowing how web servers, like just how that kind of how, how running a server can work. I always promote that. Um, and while I outgrew mine quite a while back, um, I've got my Kubernetes cluster host on DigitalOcean. And let's just talk about costs for a minute. I know that wasn't really brought up. Um, I'm not going to get into to Clever's costs because that's, that's a different beast. But for me personally, um, I, start, I brought up my Kubernetes cluster, uh, again, as a learning experience about last September. So um, still relatively new to the game. But it was not as expensive as you might think it is. Um, for me, bare minimum, um, I needed a ten dollar node. That's that's like the lowest node you can get with DigitalOcean, but and, you know, every platform will have its own. And I did need a load balancer. Um, you just you require that because with the way Kubernetes works, your your servers are going to go up and down with updates, and just the whole point of it is so you don't have to care about what your servers are. So you have to pay for a load balancer, which is also ten dollars a month on DigitalOcean. So twenty bucks a month was like my fees. Um, now, literally, like last week, I upgraded it to a bigger node, so I'm still single noding it. Again, that kind of defeats a lot of the purpose, but I just want to show like that's totally possible to still run Kubernetes in that way for personal projects. Uh, so I'm at, I'm at thirty bucks a month now. But again, total minimum, like you can get it going for twenty bucks a month easy, and that was actually more than I paid for before. But it's really satisfying to have. A re like to know if something happened catastrophically and like everything I had went away, like then I could just spin it back up. Um, again, database backups you want to you want to be careful with that, but um, your applications you don't have to like configure nginx to that specific version just because it's all already uh, infrastructure as coded already. Um, uh, can I mention something of that? Uh, you say that it defeats the purpose, but actually, I mean. If you had just had a server where you set it all up manually and you lost that or something, then you'd have to set it all up again. But in this case, even if you only have a single node, Aaron totally could say someday, eh, let's spin that up to do two or like he did. Um, technically, this is doable with a VPS. You can you know, take an image and get a bigger server and restore the image. But he could totally go, he did this weekend. Well, let's get a bigger node, a, you know, a fancier one. So back one more time and then, and then we'll do i saw some hands pop up um so yeah this weekend i mentioned i upgraded i had one ten dollar node i i was out of memory i've got quite a few projects and the the little ad the little bit that flux added put me over um it just wasn't scheduling the pods because it, i had no memory left so i had to upgrade so i thought okay i'll just get another um another po another uh server so, like i actually had two for a little bit and i just went to DigitalOcean like Bought and you know selected another one. My billing, of course, will start you know with that. But then Kubernetes, like immediately, I didn't have to do anything. Just like okay, let's just start shifting things over here now. Um, and I looked at it and I was like, oh, but now I have a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of overhead that um, with Kubernetes, a little bit of processes have to run on each node, each server, and that's how it works. Um, but I thought like, well, what if I just took the existing resources of both nodes and got a bigger node? So I just have to have like one fixed cost basically, and it's the same price. So I did that, and it's just like I'm playing around with this. And again, it's stuff you can't really do if you have like a single server that's set up in a certain way. Usually you can expand them, but like once you do that, you can't go down. And there's like there's no concept of like moving things over to another server and like automatically doing that. Um, so it's it is it's fun. I don't know. Again, I'm not a DevOps specialized person, but it's like, like if I can understand it, like anyone can understand it for sure. Um, but it's a uh, it's it was really fun to to play around with that. Okay, I think I saw some hands up. Um, a little bit. I want to make sure I'm not glossing over. Oh, that's true. We probably better better cap this out. All right. Any one last question? Anybody? Okay. I guess so. All right. Um, well, once again, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I was gonna say we are Gabe and Aaron. I'll just end that up here. Um, Thanks again, everyone, for coming. There's plenty of sandwiches, plenty of cookies left. Uh, get get all you want. Bring some for a, you know, for a friend. And uh, yeah, we'll do a tour in let's just say like five to ten minutes. I'll I'll make it clear when that happens.